Good morning. Today we'll read from Psalms 1, the two paths. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or set foot on the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and who prospers in all he does. Not so the wicked, for they are like chaff driven off by the wind. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord guards the path of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Do we have any children today besides Daphne? Are you going to stay and go through? There are some downstairs and some in there. Okay. If you'll bow your heads with me, we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the freedom to come and worship you, Lord. Open our eyes to hear your word, Lord, not to just be hearers of the word, but doers, Lord. To apply to our lives to understand personally what you are speaking to us through the Spirit so that we walk in step with the Spirit. Be with those that aren't with us today, Lord, and bring them safely back to the fold. Thank you that we are tied together with one another in spirit. Help us to learn to be the kind of children that you call us to be, to be aware, not only aware, but to look for opportunities to be like Christ in this world. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come, the, the different versions that we have and translations of the Bible, Lord. Help us to desire your word as we desire physical food. For we know that it is good to live by your word, Lord, and to taste it and to, to um, dwell on it, Lord, to hear what you would have to say. And Lord, just open our hearts to hear it today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I've entitled this Seed at Work. And Mark read from Psalm 1, but we're going to continue to be going through Luke chapter 7 and then in Luke chapter 8. And if you remember this year when I started, I started with this next section of Scripture, and I called it At the Table with Jesus, because you've reached the point in Luke's Gospel, and that's kind of why I started there and then went backwards, as you see this woman who really probably shouldn't know how to worship Jesus, but she truly worships Jesus so unlike the Pharisees and the religious leaders that want to say that everything they do has God first in their priorities, but yet their hearts are so far from Him. And we left off in Luke chapter 7 with these words, but wisdom is proved right by her children. The children that are birthed, the behavior that is done there, by your actions, by your deeds. So are you a child of God? Are you a chip off the old block? Because a chip off the old block is a chip from that block. It's like the, the father. The son is like the father. So are you a child of God? Because wisdom is proved in how you live, how you grow up, how you mature. So is there proof in your life that you are God's children? Or are you just dancing in the streets because you want a God the way you partake it? Do you want to put Jesus and God into your schedule? Or do you want to live for the one who created you, the one who brought, who bought, bought you back from the gates of hell, the one who died for you? Is Jesus your King of all kings and Lord of all lords? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? Or are you playing games in the street wanting a God in your image? Do you put a quarter in the cosmic vending machine and select what you want and get disgruntled when it doesn't do it work that way? Or do you live for God, created for His purpose, in His image? You have an opportunity in this life to live as a child of God and tell others about Jesus Christ along the way. Wisdom is proved right by her children. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. You'll see this story also in Matthew chapter 26. You'll see it in Mark chapter 14, but it's not the same story there. That's the story of Simon the leper, not Simon the Pharisee. Don't get confused. 
because your Bible may lead you to those stories. You might know the story in John chapter 12 when Mary anoints Jesus. These are not the same stories. This story is unique but similar to those stories. This is a woman who was known for her sins that comes in while they're reclining at the table. Jesus is there. He's been invited in, but yet the Pharisee has not given him the hospitality that he should have given him whatsoever, especially as him being a prophet or a man of God. He has totally overlooked this because he thinks he is righteous, and so does everyone else at the table. So when this woman, this outlandish woman of sin, whatever her sin is, but she's known for that. She is known to be a tax collector and a sinner. When she comes in, now we don't know how in the world she even gets by, but when she gets in and touches Jesus, then Simon thinks in his heart, well, this cannot be a prophet because otherwise he'd know who this is touching him. Is that how we look at this world? Is that how we look at people made in the image of God? Don't you hate discrimination and everything else in this world? We should as Christians, so we should never be a part of them. All three of these gospel accounts have women that are coming to Jesus, and that is significant because the women teach us a lot about worship, a lot about recognizing who Jesus is. And I think, men, we need to listen up. I know we had Mother's Day, Father's Day is coming up, but the, one of the reasons we have such a problem in this country is the lack of fathers in this country. Or a father can be anything in this country. We need to stand up and we need to lead by example, by dwelling on God's Word, by putting the Lord first in our life, not just a part of our life, because we have all these other things we need to do. In each account, a woman pours out a precious and costly perfume in an extravagant act of worship. Us men sometimes forget to even do the deeds. How many times do you do the deed rather than just telling your wife you love them and your children that you love them? Do you show them? Or are you too afraid to because it's not that manly? The three women come to anoint Jesus and they don't know in the, in the time they're doing it, if you read the scripture, really who Jesus is. They get blown away in his presence. This woman came in to anoint Jesus' feet. That was obvious because she brought in the material to do it. But she had no idea that she was going to start sobbing uncontrolled of the way she did in the presence of Jesus Christ. She didn't bring a towel in. She didn't prepare to do that. And when she let down her hair... She let down her sign of dignity, something that you should not do, and you have to take yourselves back to the time of Luke and everything then. That was totally shameful and disgraceful to do. She didn't plan on doing that, but she didn't care that she had to do that. She had to wipe Jesus' feet because she had already burst out into tears and poured, poured amounts of tears onto his feet. And Jesus loved her adoration for him. It was an extravagant act of worship. Jesus Christ is God's anointed and holy one, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the one that will take away people's sins. How do you act and how do you worship Jesus? Mark read from Psalm chapter 1. Well, let me read from Psalm chapter 2, starting in verse 7. I will proclaim the decree spoken to me by the Lord. You are my son. Today I have become your father. The one that a voice came from heaven saying, This is my son. I am well pleased. Verse 8. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. Therefore, be wise. Remember the verse we started with, but wisdom is proved right by her children. Therefore, be wise, O kings. Be admonished, O judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. What should we do next? Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in your rebellion when his wrath ignites in an instant. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. 
How blessed we are that Jesus came to seek and save the lost rather than to bring God's judgment to give you pardon of your sin, to invite you into the family of God. And from this point in Luke, we're going to see a lot of parables and a lot more teachings about what the kingdom of God looks like. That's why, again, why I started with this story and then went backwards and brought you to this story again. You see that in some of the movies. You just got to remember where you're at. Am I in the past, the present, where I'm at? We're at this point of true worship from someone we would not necessarily expect. We don't know her name. We don't know her sins. We just know that she came to Jesus regardless of her sins to worship Him and truly fell into worship because she came into the presence of Jesus Christ who forgave her sins. Well, let's read more from Luke chapter 7. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, past tense, She changed, just like Matthew. She left that world behind. She never looked back longingly. She didn't put her hand to the plow and look back. She was fit for the kingdom of heaven. She had lived a sinful life, but she learned that Jesus was eating at a Pharisee's house, a place where she could go in and be condemned, even be stoned. Remember that. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Maybe that was the perfume that she used to lure the men to her bed. We don't know for sure. But what we do know for sure is she came in to anoint Jesus with that perfume. And there are at least two other stories in Scripture telling a similar events. She came as an act of worship because who she knew at that point Jesus was. As she stood there, verse 38, as she stood behind his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now again, we don't know the reason that... that Jesus was invited. Maybe it was to to expose him. Maybe it was to mock him. Maybe there was some trying to learn the truth at this point. We don't know the answer to that. But we do know what was in that Pharisee's heart. We just read about it in Luke chapter 7. Judge and don't be judged. Condemn and don't be condemned. Forgive and be forgiven. Do you think they could offer forgiveness? She used to live that way. I don't know how long she had changed. Maybe they saw that. Maybe they didn't see that. But they weren't willing to offer forgiveness. They wanted to judge and condemn. And surely Jesus is not a true man of God because he would know who was touching him. <clears throat> don't you realize the sin debt that you owe God? that all of your righteousness, no matter how great it is, is filthy rags. And the only way you can be saved is by faith to take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that He will wash you white as snow to receive the King's mercy and grace lest the Son of God be upset and poured His wrath out on you. There is a day coming that that will happen. Verse 40 of Luke chapter 7, Jesus answered him. Wait a minute, he hadn't spoke yet, has he? (laughs) But he had the thought and we'll be recountable for every idle thought we have, let alone those thoughts that we have that lead to those judgmental condemnation actions. I mean, they would have welcomely got her out of that house and welcomely started to stone her. But Jesus answered Simon even though he didn't present a question. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. And whenever you read that in Scripture, look at it. Look at it well. When you see those verily, verilys, or truly, trulys, or when Jesus calls you out by name, because you're reading this gospel now, and says, Alan, I have something to tell you. And his answer back was, tell me, teacher. Do you really mean that, though? Or are you saying it in a simplistic, placating way. I get that all the time. You know, when my wife, she's like, did you hear me? Yes, I did, dear. Are you just placating me? No, I'm not, dear. (laughs) Are we? Are we truly listening to the teacher because we want to learn? Or do we go in with that closed, judgmental attitude? Yeah, I know that I should love my enemies, but I just have this problem in my heart with him. How do we approach the throne of the King of kings and Lord of lords? Do we come, first of all, to anoint Him? 
and then do we fall down and worship for who he is and what he's done and this woman did not know what Jesus would do for her but he tells this story two people owned owed, owed money to a certain money lender one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50 neither of them had money to pay him back so he forgave the debts of both now which of them will love him more now maybe this is a parable maybe this is not I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute what, what is the difference in a, par, a parable and a metaphor and a simile an allegory okay maybe this is a parable two people owed money to a certain it's a, definitely a story and it's definitely got a purpose two people owed money to a certain money lender one owed him 500 denarii so do we concentrate on that or do we concentrate on the meaning of the story 500 denarii 500 days wages versus 50 denarii which is 50 days wages 10 times does it matter if it's a hundred times or a thousand times or a million times not really in the context of this story it's a debt that neither one could pay period so the money lender forgave them both Pretty cool. We got our debt wiped. Does it really matter that his debt was 10 times what mine is? My debt was wiped clean. Shouldn't I consider that as mercy? Simon, or, neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love, me, love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Doesn't that show what's truly in your heart? I mean, you've asked, the question is asked to you again, or the statement here, Jesus said, I have something to tell you, Alan. And when I worry about what this person's done, that person's done, especially when I'm looking at the concept of God's grace, why does it matter what that person did? Even if that person did it to me, how can you forgive someone who did this to your family, to you? You can only forgive because you know God's forgiveness. Can you learn to forgive? Forgive and you will be forgiven. Don't forgive. Well, you decide. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus' answer was, you have judged correctly. Jesus then turned towards the woman and said to Simon... Notice this, he's still speaking to Simon, but he is looking at the woman. He is speaking to the woman as well. But the point is to Simon. Simon is the one who was judging. Simon is the one who thought he was righteous. Simon is the one who really didn't think he had anything to be forgiven for, but yet he just judged and condemned this woman. Do you see this woman? Look at her. Look at the one you're condemning so you can see your own sin. <clears throat> I came into your house... You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, we learned even more about the story, has not stopped kissing my feet. I mean, she pretty much immediately fell into worship when she burst out into tears and began kissing and wiping Jesus' feet. This was the bulk of what was going on. She thought she was just coming into anointing and she was going to keep her composure, but from the time she entered, basically, she was pouring tears and wiping Jesus' feet because she was in the presence of royalty. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, if I've already got Alan, I need to tell you something. I want to tell you something. Are you listening? Yes, teacher, I am. Now I'm getting, listen up. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Well, I suppose that that one who had been forgiven more loves more. Oh, yeah. So what do I need to be forgiven of? What am I realizing that even if I had an, an adulterous, murderous thought in my heart that I committed against God in all of His glory and He is sending His Son to save me and set me free. Have you been saved? Have you been saved from an eternity apart from God? An eternity where you'll know no good things. Oh, sure, today isn't necessarily the weather you want or the things you want in your life, but the absence of God in your life will be something unimaginable. And that will be your eternity. 
But whoever has been forgiven loves little. Oh, wow. Boy, that's a slap in the face to me, isn't it? Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Yeah, this story is for the woman. She came worshiping and then found a, a lot more. She had no idea who she was truly worshiping, and she found salvation. She found peace that surpasses all understanding. She found joy in the time of troubles because she left the sin behind. She realized who she was and she could not pay her sin debt and she came before Jesus and he forgave her of her sins. But yet the Pharisees sat there in their own self-righteousness and wanted to condemn Jesus but never examined their own hearts. So the other guests, whoever they were, if they were all Pharisees or well-to-do people, whatever said among this, who is this who even forgives sins? Luke has made it obvious by this point that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the Son of God, that He is Lord of the Sabbath. Everything that you can point out to of who Jesus is, that He has authority and power above any other name, do you believe? Because if you believe, you can't help but worship. So if you're sitting here and you've sat here in the pews your whole life and you've never worshipped, then you haven't come to Jesus. You've come near Jesus. You've sat at the table reclining with others with Jesus, but you haven't come and worshipped Jesus for who He is. He is not Lord of your life. You have not professed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the problem is, and it is a burden to my heart, that there are so many in the church that will die not knowing Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They will know all about Him. They will live in their own self-righteousness. They will go to church. They will proclaim they are Israel, but they are not a child of Abraham. And that is a burden in the church. Because you see the people in the family of God day in and day out, but they don't know Jesus as their brother, as their Lord, as their Savior, as their friend. And on that day there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because Jesus will say, I do not know you. Depart from me. So be careful where you're at at the table. Luke chapter 8. You want more on Luke chapter 7 in those verses? Go back to the first sermon. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. He went back to why he was called. He was called to preach to the towns the kingdom of God. The Messiah had come, the good news, to bring sight to the blind, to make those who were lame to walk, to let the deaf hear. Do you understand these things? The twelve were with him. He appointed twelve, and he, he gave them this impossible task to love even their enemies. And also some women... Wait a minute. Women were property. <laughs> also some women because there is no respecter of persons in the eyes of God. And men and women are equal. And Scripture teaches that. But there is an authority line. Even as Christ is equal with God but didn't consider equality with God as something to be used for His advantage. Instead, He humbled Himself. Do you submit to God's authority? Do you submit to the authority of this world? God is in complete control and you need to submit, especially to the king. Also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, and we get some by name, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Jonah, wife of Susa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. Many other women, because it follows after this there were men too. But Luke's emphasis here is on women. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. However that money came about, even the women left everything behind just as Levi did and left his tax collector's booth. They left that world behind to follow Jesus. Whether they had a business, whether they were a woman of the night, whether they were a homemaker, they followed Jesus because he had the words of life. Verse 4, while a large crowd was gathering, and possibly as you read Scripture, this is possibly the biggest crowd yet, and will probably lead up to that point where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And many said, um, 
this is too much for me. You're right, Jesus, you've exposed us. We only wanted physical bread. But the crowds are growing. The support for Jesus is growing. The congregation has the programs and whatever you want to say to get them in the doors, but how many of them will truly follow? Especially when it's deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. Or when suffering comes. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. Well, we know this one's a parable. We know it's not allegory. We know it's not simile. Simile is a comparison. Allegory has a hidden meaning. A metaphor symbolizes other things. A parable is a teaching lesson, simple, simple to understand, not profound in its teaching, which accents something that Jesus has taught about more to give you more spiritual guidance in it. So if he says, thou shalt not commit adultery, then the parable comes and gives you an example so you can understand more about that. Okay, but let's learn a little bit more. This is the first parable then that Luke records. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Others fell among thorns which grew up with and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil that came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. So what is Jesus expanding upon? It's a legitimate question here in Luke's gospel, the way he's presented it. Because there's no teaching right before this. We're talking about the women who left everything behind to follow Jesus. Is he talking about that? Do we go backwards and talk about the woman at Jesus' feet and the story that he told Simon and, and the moral of the story there for us to examine our own hearts and to see what true worship is like? Are we going back to the Sermon on the Plain and what he told the disciples that they were going to live for when they had no idea that's what God, Jesus was calling them to do? What is this parable expounding upon? Because Luke makes a point, and Luke is detailed in it. He writes out that prescription as a doctor that this is a parable. I'm pointing this out to you. It's a further teaching illustration. A farmer went out to sow his seed. He scattered 25% here, 25% here, 25% here, 25% here. Only one of them was able to have a successful crop. Do we compare and look at how the crop produced? We can go look at the other Gospels and see that must not be that relevant because it's not here, at least not to Luke's point of the parable. So what is Jesus further expounding, especially to you as you're reading this Gospel message? Whoever, when he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Wait a minute, that'll bring me back a little bit. Now I can go back in Scripture and see when Jesus kind of said these things before. Maybe he's given me a hint. Was it blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God? Is that what we're expounding on? Is it we're expounding on, but to those of you who will listen, I say love your enemies, do good to them who hate you? Is it why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Is it I tell you not even Israel? In Israel I have seen such great faith of that centurion. Is it to what can I compare this generation? What are they like? Those spoiled, rotten children who want to paint God in their image because Jesus is not Messiah they want Him to be? Is it when Jesus referred to John the Baptist and said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? You went out to see a prophet, right? Because there was, the Word of God hadn't been spoken in so long. Was it, Simon, I have something to tell you personally. Therefore I tell you, because your many, her many sins have been forgiven, she has loved much, but who has been forgiven loves little. What is Jesus saying to you in this parable? Okay, there's no right or wrong answer right here. Don't think I'm pointing to a certain thing. It's what Luke has said all the way up to this point. This is the first parable. Are you listening? Do you have ears that are hearing and eyes that are seeing? Because again, in church pews, there are many people who think they do, but don't. Because that seed is not impacting their heart and it is not producing a crop, especially a hundredfold crop. 
we could then take them back to those that got choked out or to those that had no root. Have you been changed? Are you a new creation in Jesus Christ? Do you come and fall at His feet in worship? And when you come into His presence, do you get blown away when you're reading the Word of God and spending time with others and doing ministry? Or is it just something you do? So verse 9, His disciples asked Him what this parable meant. All right, notice this. Before there's an answer, Jesus gives them a reason. And He's already said, do you understand? Okay? And He's talking about the kingdom of God and who the King is. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables. What? Did you catch that before? Parables are for others. They will help you t to learn more because I'm giving you this example, but you already know the truth. Have you been listening when I said, love your enemies? Do I need to give you an example of it? The word is already in your heart. I've given you a heart of flesh. I'm writing those on. Are you listening? The soil has already been prepared and the farmer came to plant the seed. But the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you already because that seed was planted. That's what brought you here in the first place and is producing. You're not one of those. You don't have to worry if that's the case that's being choked out or that has no gro root growth or was trampled and the birds taken away. But to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 600 years earlier. And Isaiah's message was not that. That was the prophecy of things to come. Isaiah's message was repent and turn to God. The same message as John the Baptist. The same way Jesus started his ministry. Repent and turn to God. But since you won't, since it goes in one ear and out the other, you will be forever seeing and not comprehending. You will be ever hearing and not understanding. And you won't even know it. You'll think while you're sitting at the table with Jesus that everything is just fine until the day. Mark chapter 4 adds, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. That's Jesus' prior words to those statements. Otherwise, they may not turn. They've reached a point now where they can't turn because they've heard so long. That, again, is the burden of a pastor because his congregation has heard and heard and heard. The person out on the street, if you're a missionary, hasn't necessarily heard. Is it because the ones that have sat and heard and heard and heard have reached the point where their hearts have been hardened and they cannot hear? Well, I don't know that, so I have to preach and I have to preach and I have to preach. And many pastors get disgruntled. I listened to a message as I was going to sleep last night talking about the number of pastors that quit because of that very part. That it just they just got burnt out. But I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> I preach because God has called me to preach. And I preach for Him. And I hear His words, period. And they pierce my heart. And I am never the same. Matthew's gospel states in Matthew chapter 13, the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and, who, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. <laughs> Now go study parables and, and everything, and I challenge you to do that more today to understand the concepts is there. But the parables are for those so they'll never understand. You already know the truth. The parable is just kind of the icing on the cake that you already have. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. In them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. You will be ever hearing, but never, added for emphasis, ever understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Boy, that takes me back to Pharaoh and who had time for his heart to be softened. But instead, they reached a point where it says in Scripture that God hardened 
his heart. He had every chance to change. For this people's heart has grown callous, and God's talking about his own children here, the children of Israel. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and do what? Turn, and then what would happen? I would heal them. That woman turned from her sins. She came to Jesus to anoint him. She didn't know what she was doing beyond that. And she fell into worship and her many sins were forgiven. But blessed are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. And Jesus is talking to the twelve disciples that have come to ask him and one among them is not one of them. Are you hearing? Hearing and obeying the word means the same thing. Or are you forever hearing and never understanding? and you can't turn, and you can't be healed. Those words from Isaiah 6 begin this way in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, even have, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were called out, calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of, the, of hosts. All the earth is full of His glory. I wonder if that's what that woman saw when she started anointing Jesus' feet. I think it is. I think she saw the heavens opened up, and she saw the Son of God. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts the door and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. But he didn't come to bring judgment. He came to heal, to seek and save the lost. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. I wonder what she thought when she saw Jesus on the cross later. Jesus as the lamb on the altar, cleansing her from all unrighteousness. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he replied, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the hearts of this people callous, deafen their ears, and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. But that is not the message that Isaiah preached. That is the result of them closing their eyes and closing their ears and their hearts being hardened. Because he preached, Repent and turn to God before it's too late. And now this woman had come and was in the presence of Jesus and she, without asking him for forgiveness of her sins, changed and came to him and he forgave her sins. And now she will either go back and the roots will not be very deep or she'll be choked out or she'll live and produce a crop. Any child knows that a farmer plants seed to grow a crop. Where are you at in this story? Isaiah realized where he was in God's story. This woman realized where she was in God's story. But Simon the Pharisee didn't, at least at this point. Do you understand? You better before it's too late because there will come harvest time. Luke chapter 8. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Now you get your meaning. The seed is the Word of God. What do you do with seed? Plant it. The seed does the rest. <laughs> Pretty simple. And you don't know how, and it's magnificent. It is a miracle of God that this seed produces. This. And you can't tell from this seed necessarily what it's going to look like. Take the mustard seed, for example. It's so tiny, but yet it produces a big garden variety type plant. Don't take Scripture wrong. It's not the smallest seed out there, but it's the smallest seed in what Jesus has given an example of to make this big plant. 
Just like it says, all of Bonner's Ferry turned out. That doesn't mean literally every person was there. That would be more of a metaphor, wouldn't it? Or a simile or whichever one it is. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Okay, here's where we're at. Has it been planted? So many times this parable gets taken all over. Who are these? Are these saved or not really saved? Oh, I want to see in the kingdom of God these that, that, that were just choked, but they're still there. That's not the point of the parable. Not at all. You can take that all you want to and make all of it you want to. But the thing is, the time has come. The seed has been planted. The seed was planted to produce a crop. Is it producing in your life? And we've just seen the example of worship. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength? That is the greatest command. And the, the second is to love your enemy as yourself. To love your neighbor. I put enemy because that's the same thing in many cases. To love everyone without judgmentalism, without condemnation. That is tough. That's a tough call and something that only a child of God can do. Otherwise, you will be choked in this world by the worries and everything else. They did this to me and I cannot forgive. And then who's ate up with it? The one that won't forgive. And there's a possibility that you're not forgiven. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and not be saved. Those on the rocky ground are ones who receive the word with joy when they, when they hear it but they have no root. They believe for a while, but at times of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But, here's your but. This is their contradiction to the other three. The seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, don't forget that in there, produce a crop. So the other three, again, I'm pointing out to you, don't matter to the story. The story is God is the farmer who has planted the seed. How is that seed working in your life? The seed is the power. Are you reading God's word? Are you hanging on every word? Are you studying to be an approved workman that rightly handles the word of truth? Do you hunger and thirst for God's word? Do you eat it more than you eat physical fruit and long for it more than that good meal? Because you can't live by physical bread alone, but you can live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And now the word was made flesh and dwelling among them. And the reason a farmer sows his seed is to reap a harvest. So obvious. Jesus continues speaking here after this parable. There's not a break here in Luke's writing. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. No, duh. No farmer plants seed and doesn't expect a harvest. No one lights a lamp except so that you can see. The Word of God has been given to you. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you. But through these parables, you'll learn more, but others will never understand. They'll think this is nonsense. What was that story about agriculture? <laughs> and I've heard that many a times. <laughs> Instead, there's your butt. They put it on a stand so that those who come in can see light. Is your light shining before men that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven? Jesus continues speaking here, verse, verse 17, For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Let me say that one again. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has been given, who, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. Jesus is the light of the world. He came into the light to be the light of men. He gave you the light so that your light would shine. Are you dampening that light in any way? 
Are you coming together with others so that that light shines more brightly? The Spirit gives gifts accordingly to each one so that the body will come together and be one living organism. That's why it's so important to be a part, plugged into a body, a church. Not separate, not just reading God's Word and studying, but getting in there with others and using their gifts and abilities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. To fight wrongs, to stand up when it comes to voting, to, to be part of politics, to feed the poor, whatever it may be. Anyone lights a lamp so that light can be given. And a farmer plants his seed so that he can harvest a crop. And you don't know how, know how that happens. And you can go to bed at night and it's still happening. And a harvest will come. So now I've got to take that. If I've been given seeds and I'm going to carry it on, how am I planting those seeds? Because it may look like in my family's life and in my friend's life that not much is happening there, but I can't see under the surface, can I? So again, I've got to be a pastor. I've got to keep on. I've got to do that with my children. I've got to build that ark so that the day when the flood comes, hopefully they enter in. All those that I have spread the seed to. Mark chapter 4 verse 23 says, If anyone has ears, let him hear. He went on to say, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. We've already heard this in Luke's gospel. And even more will be added to you. Are you planting seeds abundantly? 25% everywhere. 25% on rock that you know nothing will happen, but you don't know that. You don't, you're not the one that hardens hearts. You have no idea. And you shouldn't judge or condemn. You should plant. For whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like... Now we get this simile. A man who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day he sleeps. Night and day he awakes. The seed is at work. We can't see it. Then we see some. The seed sprouts. It grows. Though he still does not know how this happened. You don't need to know. You don't need to know the times or seasons. You need to know that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. In Bonner's Ferry, in Sandpoint, in North Idaho, in Idaho, in the Pacific Northwest, in the United States, abroad, are you planting seed, however that looks like in your life. All by itself, the earth produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then grain that ripens within. And that's why we've got to train up disciples once they come and make a profession to obey everything that Jesus has taught. So we have to be obeyers of the word also, not hearers only. Verse 29, And as soon as the grain is ripe, he swings the sickle because the harvest has come. Wow. That's where we are in Luke's gospel. I wish we went over it every day. <laughs> I wish we were like the first church and we, well, what's, what's tomorrow going to be as we dig in together? Because here's the next words of Jesus. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. These are Jesus' own physical relatives, the ones we would call family. And because the crowds were so long, the family couldn't get to see Jesus. Mary couldn't get to her son because of crowds, those that associated with Jesus. True family members couldn't get to Jesus because of all these other people that weren't family. And someone said to him, your mothers and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. What was Jesus' reply? Not physical, but spiritual. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's Word. What is God's Word? Jesus has just told us. It's the seed that has been planted in your heart to produce a crop. My mothers and brothers, my true family, are those who hear God's Word and put it into practice. So has the seed been planted? The seed, if it has been planted, is working night and day and producing a crop. Where are you at in this story? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this parable that Luke has given us, for the words of Jesus, for the word made flesh and dwelling among us, 
for the words of life that Jesus would not forsake us, never leave us or, or anything, that we are born again by the Spirit of God, adopted into the family, given comfort so that we can comfort, given joy so that we can bring joy, given gifts that we can share with others, riches upon riches upon God's grace upon grace upon grace so that we can be rich and gracious to others. Forgive us of our judgmental condemnation. Forgive us for our poor, poor, pitiful attitude or our we-can't-handle-this attitude, Lord. Help us to realize that the battle is already won through our Commander-in-Chief, Jesus Christ. And help us to fix our eyes on Him, running this race together, producing a crop, planting the seed that we know that the power is in the seed in the Word of God. So we ask, first of all, Lord, for You to plant that seed deep in the soil of our heart that we may realize the new creation that we are, to live where we don't worry about the things of this life and get choked out, where we don't not have strong roots or anything else, Lord, but where we live a life that plants seeds, that hears and obeys, that denies ourselves, takes up our cross, and follows after Jesus, a life that loves our Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and loves our neighbor as ourselves. A life that lights the path for others to see Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.